it's important to reaffirm that uh, heading and take our bearings on a regular basis. Um, I often recommend uh, bowing the first thing you do when you wake up. Uh, bowing is the first thing you do when you wake up and the last thing you do before you go to bed. Um, if you have a, a shrine with some symbol of what is most meaningful to you, to remind yourself of that heading in your life. Because without it, it's very easy to lose our way. I remember my parents uh, visiting uh, an old friend of theirs, a couple in California, and they were sitting on the porch of this couple's new house, and the, their friend said, you know, we think we finally figured it out. It's all about the view. And my parents were like, yeah, it, it is about right view. And they're like, no, no, the view, you know, like that's what the real estate's really, really about. And just a close, a near miss. And yet the near misses are everywhere around us and our gaze is constantly being averted from what's most significant. Um, there's a profound intuition in most of us about the meaning our life can have if it's dedicated towards what we're meant for, which is awakening, a complete purification of the heart and mind into a state free from greed, hatred, delusion, and utterly dedicated to giving. And yet this concept is so easily lost. I remember in high school uh, and college searching pretty desperately for anyone who embodied something special, something unique in their heart that I hadn't seen before. And finally, when I was uh, at the end of college, when I saw a video of Ajahn Chah, um, there's a documentary called The Mindful Way on YouTube, and I saw a being who looked utterly different, joyful and pure. And I'd never seen that before. And after seeing that, I knew that I needed help orienting my life in that direction. And that eventually led to robes, although it does not have to lead there for everyone. It was hard to explain, though. I think I told one of my friends before I was going uh, to Thailand, and he asked, why are you going? And I said, well, I, I really want to see. I think there are beings that are enlightened, and I would like to pursue that. And he said, yeah, you know, I took ecstasy once. I think I saw that. So I let that go. But Longpur Sumedha tells the story of coming to Amravati, the monastery in England, and suddenly becoming completely enamored with the figure of a stupa, which is a temple uh, in Buddhist terminology with a uh, peak. And that architecture of there are four corners, north, south, east, west, but then there's a transcendent peak, a goal, something that draws everything together. And that idea that our life needs a similar goal to orient to, or else it is confusing and frankly, a little depressing. And so to remind ourselves what we're practicing for and what we're meant for, and more than that, what we're capable of, it's easy to see you know, read stories of Mother Teresa and the Dalai Lama, to see pictures, to uh, hear talks by Desmond Tutu, and to think that these are the domains and potentials of beings different than us, uh, from the East perhaps with some esoteric knowledge inaccessible. And yet, what's profound about the Buddhist teaching is that we are eminently capable of achieving a state of purity of heart. And I know many Westerners, I believe, who have. But it requires a dedication. And in so many of the gatherings and talks, we speak about all the practical means the Buddha gave us to that end. The ways we can meditate every day, following the breath, 
how we can reacquaint ourselves with the somatic sense of the body, calm the mind, different ways of looking at experience, and yet to not speak often of what all that is aimed towards misses something. So the goal of this path is Nibbana, awakening or enlightenment. And when the Buddha defined that, uh, Nibbana is actually a very colloquial term. It means to cool. And it was used very commonly in the ancient Pali. You'd put out a bowl of soup to Nibbana to cool. So the Buddha was not using sort of highfalutin language. It was very simple, down-to-earth terminology. And yet it, what it was was the cooling of greed, hatred, and delusion. Namely, there's another teacher who said that the source of suffering is the mind going outside of itself. And greed and hatred are us feeding off of the world, pulling the world in and pushing the world away when the world is just what the world is. And delusion is the core of both. Greed and hatred are the two arms of delusion. And in the Buddha's time, fire was looked at as being bound to a log, uh, agitated. And greed, hatred, and delusion were thought of as fires that burnt the heart. And the idea was that when that fire went out, it didn't cool or uh, it didn't die, but rather pervaded uh, all of reality as a, what was called agi, or this quality of, um, basically it, it was released and pervaded everything. And similarly, when the Buddha spoke about the enlightened mind, he spoke about light that lands on nothing. This is difficult because as Westerners, we come often, those of us who are Westerners, from a northern European culture where when the fire went out, it meant death. But if you put yourself in the Ganges River Valley during the height of summer, heat was not a great thing. And the idea of cooling was actually very attractive. So this is Nibbana, enlightenment. And the Buddha was careful about how he spoke about it because one feature of meditation is that whenever you encounter a more refined state, these are the most powerful, beautiful states you've ever experienced. And the, the proclivity to take them as God, to attach to them as a true self, to become stuck, is almost irresistible. And the Buddha saw his teachers getting stuck in just this way again and again. And so he was very restrained with teaching a path of articulating rather than exactly what we're moving towards with enlightenment, because that's beyond words anyways, rather articulating what we are letting go of. We're letting go of craving. We're letting go of greed, hatred, and delusion. We're letting go of this egocentric way of viewing the world. And just as it's difficult to articulate what good health means, when someone asks, what does it mean to be in good health, you, you just say what okay, I'm not ill, I don't have this illness, I don't have this issue. Similarly, it's difficult to articulate what that perfect state of health in the mind and heart looks like, except by to articulate what you let go of. So the Buddha gave us this via negativa, apophatic method, articulating truth and enlightenment by what it is not. And he trusted that if you keep letting go of all those selfish and deluded tendencies of craving that burn the heart, you, get, you become more and more able to see and experience for yourself the goodness that you come to. And there's no need to describe it in too much detail. It's awakening, enlightenment. The Buddha talked about this path in, uh, as occurring in stages. The first stage of enlightenment is considered uh, called stream entry or sotapanna. Um, and each of these stages uh, lets go of a series of fetters of the heart, uh, manacles of the heart. So the first stage is stream entry, sotapanna. The second is sakaragami. Um, 
And stream entry uh, involves letting go of three fetters, namely self-view, which is identifying with any of the uh, five aggregates if people know what those are. So these sort of locuses of identity we take as ourselves, the body, feeling, perception, uh, mental formations, that is sort of our programs of our personality, um, the ways we think of ourself, and consciousness. And we, when we let go of this fetter, realize that none of those things are really us. And we stop trying to cling to them because when they change, as they inevitably do, when the body gets sick, when our perception changes, when our sankara of, say, a certain way of interacting as the extrovert, as the funny one, as the clown, doesn't work anymore, then because we no longer tie our hearts to those things or really identify with them, the heart doesn't break when they break. The second fetter at stream entry is skeptical doubt. So uh, when someone, they say, encounters this state of breakthrough, they see truth in such vividness that they no longer have doubt that this is possible, that the mind can be freed, the heart can be purified, and that this practice is the way to do it. And the third is attachment to rites and rituals, sila pata paramasa, which actually means uh, paramasa is almost like fondling. So it's like fondling these rites and rituals and holding them as liberating in and of themselves. So yes, we bow, we chant, but we understand these are just skillful means, and really it's all about intention in the heart. The second level of enlightenment is sakadagami, a once-returner. The third level is a non-returner. And at the second level, the fetters of sensual desire, uh, pulling into sensuality and trying to feed off of the world, and aversion, uh, trying to push the world away, these are weakened. At the third level, a non-returner, these completely disappear. They're completely gotten rid of. And then the fourth and final stage of awakening, arahantship, involves shedding the final five fetters of desire for rebirth in the fine material realm, the immaterial realm, uh, basically very refined states of consciousness you can access in meditation, conceit, the idea that I am, um, restlessness, a subtle hovering and movement of the mind and heart, and finally, ignorance, the fundamental core of what keeps us deluded. And when someone achieves this breakthrough, they are completely freed and the heart is utterly pure. And this sounds like a, you know, if anyone's played role-playing games in Dungeons and Dragons, it seems like this like, strange little leveling system and kind of arbitrary and a bit uh, gives rise to a lot of doubt. But what's useful to realize is that each of these stages has to do with letting go of a, another layer of identity and of conditioning. So the first level of stream entry has to do with letting go of and seeing through and past our social conditioning. So you let go of identification with the aggregates, um, your name, your nationality, your gender, your body, um, all these things you've formally taken as yourself, everything that's been given to you since birth. You let go of attachment to rites and rituals. So all these kind of programs of the culture uh, that you've become so accustomed to, you see through them. And by letting go of doubt, you see a path that is not dependent on culture or conditioning. So that's the first shedding. And at anagami, the third stage of awakening, when you let go of sensual desire and ill will, that's seeing through the biological level of conditioning. So every being, whether they be uh, human, animal, or otherwise, uh, has this uh, biological urge to feed off of the world and to push away that which it doesn't want. It's, bio, it's in our biology. And so that's a much deeper layer of conditioning and it takes longer to get rid of. So that's the third stage of awakening. And the final and fourth stage of our hauntship has to do with shedding the most deep delusions and 
conditions of the heart itself, of the mind, this sort of subtle conceit, this subtle restlessness, this subtle ignorance. And it can be easy to dismiss what that looks like if we've never seen it. But there are beings, and I really believe this, quite a few still in existence who have achieved arahantship, who have become enlightened, and it is possible. I know several uh, lay people, I think, have who have attained stream entry. And the Buddha says that that stream entry phase is the most significant uh, in a sense that once you've achieved it, the heart is irreversibly shifted and your entire orientation in life and in future lives is dedicated towards awakening. Um, often uh, in the suttas, it was said that Venerable Sariputta, one of the chief disciples, would usher monks and nuns into stream entry, and then Mahamogalana, the other chief disciple, would bring them to arahantship or to full awakening. And this stream entry, this breakthrough, um, it's also said that once one attains stream entry, uh, future rebirths cannot be low. Uh, one can't descend to too dark of a state below the human realm if you believe in rebirth. And it's really interesting to, uh, in the suttas, there's a distinction between, and in the commentaries, the path and the fruit. So there's an idea that you can, when the mind begins to break through into seeing truth, it takes a while for it to bridge that gap. That's called the path moment. And in later commentaries, this got uh, pictured as a split second, and then suddenly you were awakened to some level of reality. But when you hear teachers who have, I think, achieved this state, it seems like it's a more gradual process. One teacher, I know, uh, this was initiated in him, uh, at least if you believe this, by seeing an autopsy of a policeman. And suddenly, on the table, he saw, uh, in, in Thailand, often monks and nuns will go see autopsies, actually, to see through the body and let go of their attachment to it. And seeing this body on the table, he suddenly saw that it was just a body. And you see this all throughout the suttas, is that breakthrough and seeing through the body as a self and seeing that the body is not a self, not worth attaching to. And as the heart unties from that, that, that particular khanda, that particular aggregate, that disentangling is so powerful that time and again, in the suttas, that's what issues someone into stream entry. It's such a powerful breakthrough. So this teacher talks about after having seen this police officer's body as just a body, for the next few days, his whole worldview had shifted, and he saw everyone as these sort of robots walking around and saw that they were just these bodies steered by these hearts. But he saw the two as very separate and then over the course of several months, something shifted until there was a complete breakthrough. And the, it's interesting to um, speak about this with, uh, you know, there's some question if one believes in rebirth about what this looks like in a future rebirth if someone has this chief stream entry. And there's, one story I know that was talked about by a teacher where there was a nun, um, or sorry, the uh, queen of Thailand had a fashion designer who was extremely uh, refined and loved to go to Paris for operas. Um, she was a very good person. And one day she went and offered a meal to a famous uh, forced Ajahn, a teacher. And the teacher, after having given them meditation instructions, came up to her and said, you should, come and um, you should come and meditate at the monastery sometime. And she looked at him and said, I don't want to meditate at the monastery. I want to be a nun. And quickly she sold, uh, put down her entire career, sold her gigantic wardrobe, she was a fashion designer, and moved into a little hut at this monk's monastery. And there's a story of the queen going and visiting her and sort of 
uh, walking into her hut and seeing just this simple uh, dwelling with very little in it and just being astounded by how much she'd uh, changed from the woman she knew. And not that this has to issue into, you know, an insight like this has to issue into a renunciation like that, but just to say that this potential lies within each of us. And the Buddha gave four factors for stream entry that help one move towards it. And that is the uh, voice of another, so hearing the teachings, uh, which is why it's so helpful to listen to Dhamma talks, to go to teachings, to tune in to those uh, teachers who you trust. Um, the second is uh, associating with good people. So surrounding yourself with people that are as wise or wiser than you, if you can. Saparisa Sangseva. The second two conditions are internal. That's appropriate attention, so turning your heart and mind constantly towards the path and towards those things which are wholesome. And the fourth is practicing Dhamma in line with Dhamma. So figuring out what practice feels right for you, what's the right balance of not pushing yourself too hard and tying yourself in knots and not being too relaxed and losing yourself in the world and practicing in line with that. And the Buddha said that if you did this, uh, stream entry was possible. And as you move, or as a being moves through all those stages of letting go to complete enlightenment, what you find is if you meet people like that, who there's something qualitatively different about their hearts, there's this utter trustworthiness in them and their entire lives are dedicated just to giving. And the difference they can make in people's lives is astounding. I've seen people meet uh, monks like this for five minutes and suddenly their whole course of their life shifts because deep in them, they've been waiting their entire life to meet and affirm this deep intuition for in themselves that this is what is possible, that they are capable of this. And to see it embodied in a living and breathing human being should shake a person. And, you know, some, I don't know, uh, it's impossible to attest to the state of the heart of these people without, you know, there's no way of knowing for sure if they're enlightened or not. But some beings I know who seem to have purified their heart to a level I've rarely uh, encountered. Their whole lives, morning till night, are dedicated to giving, and that's it. So Ajahn Chah would wake up at 3 a.m., meditate and give, uh, a do you know, meditate and chant with the monks. He'd receive lay people and give advice all through the day, and often he would go and teach until 11 p.m., and he'd do it day after day. The current abbot of Wat Bapong, uh, Long Por Liam, will, uh, I knew a monk who was his assistant, and Ajahn Liam would go uh, serve constantly all day, and then he would go to bed. He slept in a little tent underneath his kuti, just to, uh, you know, in the forest, basically, to set a good example. And he would go to bed so that his attendants would be able to go to bed, but then he would get right back up and go and fix pipes elsewhere in the monastery. And I know monks who would find him randomly at different kutis, like fixing the plumbing, and this is what becomes possible, is this sort of level of power in the heart and giving. And truly, it is what each of us is capable of if we dedicate ourselves to practice. Um, so this is why we reset our compass every week. We come together. We uh, dedicate ourselves to what's meaningful. And uh, in a sense, we take on faith as a working hypothesis. Um, that's what it means in the Buddhist conception is, can we believe enough that this is possible for us, that we are willing to try and realize truth for ourselves? And I think deep down, most of us understand that that is one of the few, that is the only thing um, 
worthy of our lives and of our deaths, no matter what the external circumstances look like, monk, nun, lay person. If that life is dedicated towards awakening, then it's one well used. So good luck. Sadhu, 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 anumodami. So we have time for some Q&A or discussion. If people raise their hand, we can have a mindful mic runner come over to you. Just say your name and your question. And if you're on Zoom, you can raise your electronic hand and, and or type something into the chat. Um, we have Mary on Zoom who has a question. Mary. Hey, Mary. <laughs> hello, Ajahn. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for that talk and that movement of progress through to see the process of how this goes. I, I have one comment and a question. So my comment is I'm finding aging, like serious aging, to be really helpful in separating away from the body. It is just so obvious that the, I don't know what we call it, internal spirit chitta, is very different than the body. And the longer I live, the more evident this gets. So I'm excited about that part of this part of life. Hmm. And um, here's my question. I was in a conversation with an old friend, a Kalyanamita from the old days, the old recollective awareness days. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about an experience I had. So briefly, I got some news that was depressing and I felt depressed for like a day. And then I noticed that this depression, like, Every single negative self-statement I ever made was just glomming on to this. And I could feel a dependently arisen self coming that was depressed, that was negative, that was something. So I saw it. I said, I see you, Mara. And it fell away. When I was talking to my friends about this experience, we were talking about the observer in it the observing of this dependent origination self, watching it arise, she said the observer was a self. And I'm torn on that. I know this gets into <laughs> words and how sticky they can be. But to me, it seemed like the observer is part of the function of wisdom. It seems impersonal. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that, the observer part of us. Thank yeah. you. Real softball there, Mary. Thanks. <laughs> no, that's a, it's a really good question. Um, the word for mind and heart in Buddhism is citta, um, C-I-T-T-A. And the thing about citta is it's actually a verb. So it sort of means to, to cognize, but to perceive something as an object of awareness, the only way to do that would be to perceive it's coming into being and it's passing away. Because otherwise, you know, if something is unchanging, it's impossible to perceive as an object. And so if the observer, the observer couldn't observe itself arising and passing away. It's like a knife trying to cut itself. And so this is where the Buddha, I think, steered clear of so many uh, problems is he, what ultimate reality is and what exists when you let go of all these false clingings, he was so restrained about articulating because he saw that tendency to take it as an object to see come back to the observer and then say okay that's myself with a capital s and there's a story of mechi geo she was this nun in thailand who by all accounts became an arhant 
and she'd come to this profound state of concentration of breakthrough. I think she was probably an anagami at the time of a non-returner. And she talks about, she came to this glowing center of light, this core of, of awareness. And she went to Ad Longta Mahabua, one of the most famous teachers in Thailand of the last century, and told him about her, his exper her experience. And he said, look, you're standing in the middle of the room and you're not realizing that you're still standing there as the observer. And she took that back and in walking meditation the next morning, she let go of even that core of light. She saw that that was the core of, of, of vija, of ignorance. And, and apparently that was the breakthrough for her because when she let go of that, she achieved awakening. So what the Buddha says is that quality of craving, of creating and grasping to a self, that's the issue. And there's this process of stepping back and observing experience but there's no real need to reify that observer in a doctrinal point because how could you know the observer anyways? Um, there's a real tendency to want to do that. And yet I think that's where a lot of spiritual systems get caught is they are like, okay, the observer is the self and then they're kind of, that's where things get stopped. And so the Buddha just said, keep letting go and don't try to kind of attach to that observer as a self either. And what you come to when you let go of of even that is beyond words. Um, Longtime Mahabua said that when we practice samadhi, concentration and morality, we think in terms of self. You're creating a beautiful self. When we think in terms of wisdom, we think in terms of not self. So you're letting go of everything. Enlightenment, which we come to, is beyond all of that. So I hope that, yeah. I think the Buddha gave us a good enough approach, pretty much. Language begins to break down and we just accept that. So just keep on stepping back and observing and letting go of suffering. It gets very confusing when you try to think about what sort of self you're letting go of. Yeah. Hi, Anjan. Do you, are you familiar with the stories of, uh, the story of Sarah Connie and the stream entry? And would you be interested in talking about him as a particular example? It's okay if not, I'm just curious how you, thank you. If you want to get a bunch of uh, monastics debating each other, <laughs> there's like three things you can bring up and this is one of them. <laughs> so um, Sarah Connie is a story of a, uh, the Buddha, uh, there's a lay person named Sarakani who passes away and the Buddha declares him a stream enterer and the other monks come up and say he was a drunk uh, If he's a stream enterer, then I think anyone can be a stream enterer or something like that or like how could he possibly have achieved awakening and uh, You can tell me if I'm getting the quote wrong Shannon, but uh, I think he said something to the effect of um, Even these trees if they could understand what is uh, well said and not well said, I would declare stream, stream enterers. How much more so Sarakani? Sarakani practiced well at the end of his life, I think, something of that nature. So, yeah, so it's heartening because, I mean, trees, but uh, <laughs> it's also very confusing. Um, I've heard a few different uh, takes on it. One is the idea that Sarakani, in Tibetan, they had this idea that right after death, there's a moment or at death, um, where awakening is actually very available. You're like letting go of a lot of things and suddenly things can shift radically. And um, I've heard it said that it could be in this case that Sarakani was a drunk, um, but then when he, right when he died, he had a breakthrough and that was why he achieved stream entry. Um, and otherwise, I don't know, I think, uh, yeah, that's as far as I know on it. And as to the tree thing, I'm not sure except to say that um, knowing what is ill and well said might be actually quite a high bar in terms of a deep intuition of truth. Um, and maybe that level of intuition requires breakthrough. Um, so, yeah, good question. Yeah. It's a non-answer. Sorry. <laughs> 
it is heartening because it makes it seem more available than we might think. Yeah, Tamsin. Oh, but actually, the people on Zoom need to need to hear you. <laughs> Hi, sorry. Um, <clears throat> it, this is a very basic question, but going back to your meditation and visualizing the white light, mm. when I do these meditations, for me, it's strictly intellectual. I'm just telling myself words without any corresponding physical identification. And so I feel like it's, I don't know, like I'm going shopping or something, you know, it's not connecting at a level that perhaps focusing on my breath is. Is it still worthwhile exercise to just talk myself through white light passing through that body exercise? It, it just, I feel like I'm missing some vital connection. Thank you. Um, that meditation was from uh, Ajahn Lee. It's called Method Two in Keeping the Breath in Mind. Um, he's a famous Thai teacher. And I'd say that if it doesn't connect, that's fine. Um, don't feel obligated to do it at all. Um, it's... Mm -hmm. Sorry, no, I don't mind doing it. I just feel... Uh, like an imposter. <laughs> like yeah, yeah. Everybody no, it, else is experiencing the white bliss, and <laughs> no, no. That's that's what I'm saying. Is yeah. Don't if it doesn't connect. I'm you know, even if there's no aversion to it, if it's just kind of like, huh, this isn't really doing it for me, then don't do it. Um, I'd say that some people have uh, a pro like a, a leaning towards embodied breath meditation, and especially say someone who's maybe done a bit of qigong or something, and this really works for them. I find some people don't connect with that way of working with the breath at all. Um, and some people particularly seem to be more drawn to like uh, meditations on emptiness or the sound of silence. Uh, like long por tomato seems a lot more like that. So, um, you know, with these guided meditations, I, I'm trying to like give people different tools that they can use. But if one doesn't hit, yeah, then, then it's fine. Good, good call. Yes, Zoom person. Hello. Hello. Oh, we can hear um, you, I think. Yes. Okay. So my question is, um, you talk about a lot of people gain faith when they meet someone that, it, that feels special. Mm. But how much should we trust that intuition? Because I feel like, let's say I see somebody and I feel a bit uncomfortable even though he's an Ajahn, let's say, but, but that could totally be mm. my, my internalizations of, um, of whatever is out there. So like, how much can we trust that? Great, great question. Um, the Buddha was very cautious around this, actually. He said, you can only know a teacher well after living with them for a long time, not a short time, being discerning, not undiscerning. And then you look at them for states associated with greed, hatred, and delusion, etc. But it takes a long time to get that sort of um, as much trust as you you can on someone that's not, you know, that you don't, uh, that's not you. Um, so I'd say there's two levels. One is, you know, if you meet someone who invokes or catalyzes this feeling of real faith, then uh, there's no downside in allowing that to brighten your heart. And I'd say certain teachers are well attested to, say like you read about or see videos of Ajahn Chah, I'd say that's a pretty safe bet. Um, but as to who you submit, um, you know, really give your trust to, uh, I think that is a different question and that should be done very carefully. And it's really worth noticing um, I know someone who once asked Long Porpasano to be his teacher, and Long Porpasano said, look, in the Theravada, we only have three gems. In, in Tibetan and some other ones, they have a fourth gem of the guru gem. And there's, so there's the idea of there's the Buddha Dhamma Sangha uh, in traditional conception, 
and then some traditions add on a guru, which is like, it's conceived of as kind of the lens through which um, the teaching is refracted or focused. And that can actually be very useful if you do have a teacher you trust, is to really, um, you know, put, put trust in them if they've earned it, or, or if, if you've observed them carefully. But in the Theravada, we have three, only three gems. And all to say that there's, it's good not to completely give yourself over to someone, um, you know, to trust your internal sense of truth as well. And it just requires balance. But I'd say that your caution around giving yourself uh, to a teacher is really well-placed. And you only need to look through the last 70 years of spiritual history in the U.S. to see the real danger in, in sort of uh, incautious submission or something like that. And so I'd say it's much better, yes. Like, take faith and inspiration where you can, but as to act who you really take as a teacher, um, just be cautious and pay attention to your own heart as well. Don't give that over. Yeah. Okay, I think actually we uh, should... Um, wrap up, if that's all right. Um,